from a logical standpoint, if you're giving a drug or if you're taking a drug to do something, shouldn't you know if you're getting the effect? That's something people who are taking aspirin really don't know. Aspirin has been used now since about the late 1980s to prevent heart attack, and it was actually approved by the FDA in 1988 for that purpose, to prevent second events. While attending a dinner about 10 years ago, Gordon Enns heard one of the world's leading cardiologists say, The day is coming, we're going to have to dose aspirin. And I turned to my technical director and I said, we don't have a test. If you're going to dose something, how would we do that? Good news is, Gordon had the knowledge and the expertise to find that answer. Gordon graduated from Tabor College, located just north of Wichita, with a degree in chemistry. Shortly after graduating, Gordon went to work at the University of Colorado Medical Center, doing groundbreaking research on blood clotting. I was fortunate to work with uh, a Dr. Von Kalla, who was from Germany and about 20, 25 years ahead of his time. And that's where I gained an appreciation for blood clots and for the impact that blood clots have on our lives. In 1976, Gordon set up his own reference laboratory. It was early. It was, I was a bit of an entrepreneur, I guess. I uh, was ahead of was following Dr. Von Kalla's lead. I was a little ahead of my time and uh, had some tremendous struggles, but we survived and the importance of blood clotting just continued to grow. But not all of his friends supported him when he first began. But oh no, people thought I was nuts. All of my friends said, why would you start a laboratory for blood clotting? Because it's just not important enough. It might not have been viewed as important then, but it sure is now. That laboratory then became the place for all major clinical reference laboratories to turn for information on blood clotting. Because of our expertise in this area, we were, we were considered the best at what we did. That was my background, was consulting for cardiologists and hematologists and neurologists and anybody that was interested in blood clotting. Our job was to find out why people had blood clots. So while attending that dinner on dosing aspirin, Gordon decided his next goal would be to find a way to test its effectiveness. Right now, low-dose aspirin is what doctors tell people to take to prevent a heart attack or stroke. And low-dose would mean 81, 162 to 325 milligrams. So that became the standard of care. But just because it's standard doesn't mean it's effective. Over time, doctors began noticing that even though their patients were on aspirin, they still ended up in the emergency room having more heart attacks, having strokes, or death. As many as 20% were having second attacks, which doctors referred to as being aspirin-resistant. Why would that happen? For various reasons, we don't all respond the same way to a dose of aspirin. We could all take an 81 milligram dose, and it would work real well for some, and not so well for others. Some people don't absorb or uh, assimilate all of the aspirin that gets into their blood. It just doesn't get where it's supposed to. So it's a biochemical reason. Uh, another big reason is people also take non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, Motrin, ibuprofen, things like this. If you take those drugs before you take the aspirin, they can block the aspirin binding site in the platelet. Now platelets are the tiny cells in your blood that start the formation of blood clots if they're too sticky. Aspirin makes platelets less sticky if the dose is working. So when you take your aspirin, the site's blocked and the aspirin goes right through. So aspirin only stays in your blood about one hour after you've taken it and then it's gone. So you're making platelets continuously throughout the day. And so those platelets are going to be completely unaffected. Genetics can also play a role, although that may be a very small percentage. And this is so new, we don't know what that actual number is, but it's being estimated at least 5% of the population has a genetic reason that aspirin just simply can't work. And even worse, some people who think they're taking aspirin really aren't. A major aspirin manufacturer conducted a survey of the general public concerning aspirin use. They found out that over 10% of these people walking on the streets 
said they were taking aspirin were actually taking Tylenol or something else that doesn't have aspirin. And there's even something else to consider. Even if a certain dose of aspirin works for you today, that doesn't necessarily mean it will work tomorrow. The crazy thing is, saving your life could be as simple as adjusting your dose. It's actually, it's very important then that we know if the dose is sufficient. Some people just need to go from an 81 to two 81s, or maybe up to a 325. Some people probably need another alternative drug. And the good news is, there are other drugs. So it's not just a bad news story if you're tested and you find out it doesn't work. So how do you know if it's working for you? Gordon has found the answer. And what I did was I found a test that was used for other purposes. And then we in turn started applying it to measuring aspirin effect. So how does your test work? What is, I mean, why is it so successful? What's the difference? It's, it has several differences. Um, one is it actually measures the chemical in the body that the aspirin is trying to prevent from being formed. That chemical is known as thromboxane. Thromboxane is produced by the platelets. This thromboxane then uh, does a couple of things. It makes platelets stick together and it increases blood pressure. Too much thromboxane is bad. So if you have a high level of this thromboxane while you're taking an aspirin, this means that the aspirin is not as effective as it should be. Test results don't always lead doctors to increase the amount of aspirin people take. Some doctors actually use it to lower the dose of aspirin because aspirin does have side effects. Another benefit of this test is the fact that it's easy to use. Patients can just go into their doctor, give a urine sample, and they can be tested. So that means your doctor is using that test, right? Wrong. Why isn't every doctor in the country using this now? Well, that's a great question. Uh, number one, it's, it's quite new. Uh, this entire concept of aspirin resistance is, is quite new, and so doctors are just beginning to find out about it. Uh, the test was actually cleared by the FDA a year ago, and after that, the bigger laboratories have now started to offer the test, and we have begun the educational process. You know, the pharmaceutical companies, of course, have lots of money. So if we were driven by a big pharmaceutical company, this test would be standard of protocol. It would be, because it just takes money. All we need is 30 days of ads on, on TV. But that information is slowly making its way out into the mainstream media. There are several very substantial outcome studies that are about to be published, that are in the process now of going into the peer-reviewed medical journals. The good news is taking aspirin does help some people. This test could make sure it helps even more. Take an aspirin. You've had a heart attack, you're taking an aspirin to prevent a second attack, that your risk goes down 25%. Well, that sounds exciting. That's fantastic. It is good news. But what does that mean for the other 75% that it's not working? And so now it's not all because their aspirin dose is not effective. There are other reasons. But certainly that is one of the factors.